woodland yawned and stretched into life at the start of another seemingly perfect summer's day. There was a steady flow of sluggish activity in the old log house as the trainers prepared to make their two hour, one metre journey from their home to the cotton factory business. It was peak season for the cotton mill and there was lots of work to be done if all the orders were to go out on time. The pace of life was calm and tranquil and that suited the trailers. There wasn't a single solvable problem in the world right now, except for one thing, Graham. Graham wasn't like the rest of the other trailers. He yearned for excitement. He wanted to live life in the fast lane for a change and experience the thrill of a big city instead of sloping around the woodland at snail's pace. Unlike the other trailers, Graham could move quite quickly for a snail. He had mastered the skill of encasing himself in his shell and rolling at great speed, giving him lightning swiftness. For this simply fueled his frustration at the unhurried pace of life he found so attractive. The boring, daily, monotonous routine of working in the cotton mill and living with his painfully slow moving family made him feel like running away to a new life. But he never did. He loved his family too much and the thought of leaving them behind was too painful to even consider. To help him block out at his desires for a more adventurous life, Graham found many ways to amuse himself. His favourite pastime was pulling pranks on the other trailers. Graham was a true master in the art of practical jokes, much to the frustration of his family. Every single day he would carry out some sort of prank, but he was always careful not to target the same snail twice in a row. To make today into something really special, Graham set himself the challenge of pranking every single trailer in just one day. He had everything carefully planned out because he was determined to set a new pranking world rec record. After all, it was April Fool's Day. First on Graham's practical joke hit list was Sylvia the Pink Princess. Sylvia was obsessed with keeping clean and how she looked. She was always first up in the morning to take an extended bath and she would never let anybody see her without her glamorous eye makeup done and her shell shining like a supernova. Oh, what a beautiful morning. Oh, what a beautiful day. I've got the beautiful feeling sang Sylvia as she closed her eyes and sank beneath the bubbly bath water. Graham sneakily slimed into the bathroom, took hold of Sylvia's shiny shell and hid it in the airing cupboard. Help! Help! We've been robbed! Someone has stolen my prize shell! Call the police! Help! Help! Graham couldn't control his laughter any longer. <laughs> April Fool, Sylvia! You fell for that one. Your shell hasn't been stolen, it is in the cupboard. Don't worry, you've wo you won't have to go to work naked. <laughs> Graham left Sylvia to sulk in the bath. Graham sank his way to work. I love to sing her, by the moon and the dune and the springer. I love to sing her, by a sky or blue or a tea for to her. And the thing of a swinger to an I love you. Her. I love to, I love to sing. Because of their love of eating snails, Fred feared Frenchmen and all things French. The only thing to make him more nervous than that was salt. Salt in the snail is fatal. It melts their skin and turns them into a sticky lump of goo. That gave Graham the perfect combination for his pank on Fred. He filled a bucket with harmless sugar grain but sneakily wrote on the side, warning, strong French salt, and balanced it on the top of the door to conduct his favourite of all pranks. Oh me, oh my, what's that? cried Fred as the bucket landed on his head, covering him entirely in white granules. He shook his head to release the bucket which fell on the floor with a bang. Strong French salt? Ah! Help me! Help! I'm melting! This is an assassination. Call the police! I'm melting! Graham was in a fit of laughter. He couldn't believe Fred's reaction. Oh, you found my sugar, Fred, thanks. Sugar? Sugar? You mean to tell me that this is sugar and not salt? Yeah, I often store my sugar in a salt bucket. It stops you lot borrowing it. I'm melting, I'm melting. Fool Fred once, more fool Fred. Fool Fred twice, more fool you. 
The trails did not have to wait for the lunchtime bell to sound to know it was time to eat because loud rumbling from Kenneth's stomach let them know dinner was due. Oh boy, I am hungry today. Hungry than I've ever been. In fact, I'm more hungry than a hungry hippo from Hungary. One of Graham's daily jobs was to deliver lunch to the rest of the trailers because it took most of them too long to get to the dining table. Ah, I, I hope Graham doesn't hang about today. I'm wasting away. Knowing how much he loves his food, instead of placing Kenneth's food in the fridge to keep it cool, he placed it in the deep freezer and it set like ice. There you, there you go, Kenneth. Sausage meat and sultanas, the cornerstone of any healthy lunch. Good lad, our Graham. Never sluggish or sluffle when it comes to standing out the food. I think I'll gobble this down in one. He opened his mouth as wide as it would go and swallowed his entire meal in one gulp. Very quickly, Kenneth's face turned sour and his eyes felt angry as he spat out his lunch, which went hurling across the factory floor. Graham! Myrtle liked nothing better than to spend his lunch time sitting by the pond to do a spot of fishing. I don't think anyone would notice if I just get a quick 40 winks. With his baitless fishing rod casually tickled the surface tension of the pond. His drowsy eyes flickered with fatigue and he was soon fast asleep. Now's my chance, sniggered Graham who was watching from the bushes. He dove straight into the water in search of Myrtle's fishing hook. The only fish living in the pond were the Finleys, and they knew never to go anywhere near Myrtle's hook. But Graham was straight over, attached a bag of coins, and gave a sharp yank on the line. Good heavens! I think I've actually caught something! Graham quickly sped away and soared out of the pond to the opposite bank. Oh, Myrtle, have you caught something? Great snail trails. What is that? It's a bag of German Euros. German Euros? What on earth do I want with German Euros? Well, you are the Chancellor of Germany, aren't you? What are you talking about, Graham? German Chancellor. Angela Merkel. Angela Merkel. Get it? It's a joke. I don't get it. He watched Graham race off into the distance in search of his next victim, then promptly fell soundly asleep once again. With the afternoon shift in full swing, Graham decided to target his next victim. Dillis Crane, the general manager of the cotton mill, came down from her office onto the production floor looking for Fred. Have you seen Fred? I must speak with him urgently about this cotton order. Fred? He's gone for cotton. I'll try later. Half an hour later, Dillis reappeared once again and asked Graham. Fred? No look, I'm afraid. He's gone for cotton. A quarter of an hour later, Dillis made her third visit to the production line and confronted Graham in a very stern manner. Is Fred back yet? Fred? Fred's dead. What? what? Tears begin to fill up one with eye. Yes, he was crushed by a creeping stampede of tortoises. But don't worry, I've already thought of the wording for his gravestone. Here lies Fred, gone, but not for cotton. <laughs> April Fool! Graham Trailer, you absolute turnip. Is this another one of your wind-ups? Of course it is. Fred's taken a late lunch. He's down at the shell shop getting a wax and polish. One of these days, Graham, so help me, one of these days. With just have left on his hit list, Graham was on schedule to complete his despicable prank plan. This one will, will be the easiest out of them all. Avril was the least confident of all the trailers. She suffered with her nerves and always felt like the ugly sister compared to Sylvia's natural beauty. Avril's dream was to become a famous singer and make re hit records. But the sad truth was, she was tone deaf and actually had a terrible singing voice, much like a rooster with intended flu. Avril often worked alone in, out in the field picking cotton to, so to not offend anyone with her awful singing, and today was no exception. 
when out of nowhere appeared Graham waving his mobile phone. Come quickly, Avril. World famous record producer Simon Trowell is on the telephone. He wants to offer you a record deal. OMG. I don't believe it. The Simon Trowell wants to offer me a record deal? How? Why? When was he? Yeah, Myrtle sent him a recording of your singing and he wants to sign you up for a record deal. You'll be a star. Oh, this is the best day of my entire life. He wants you to change your name to Avril the Bean. And do you know what song he wants you to sing? No, I can't guess. Please tell me. It's a new hit single called What a Fool I've Been. Hello, Mr. Trowell. At the third stroke, the time will be 5.15 precisely. Realising it was a joke and she was actually listening to the speaking clock, Avril cried out. You're a right little funny bones, aren't you? Well, that's typically incorrect from you, Avril. And ironic on two counts because you don't find it funny and I'm a snail, so I don't have any bones. <laughs> See ya. Bell rang at the end of a working day as Graham punched the air and exclaimed, I did it! A new Woodles record for the most pranks in one day. Graham, you're a genius. I'm off, folks. See you back at the house. He shot out of the door and raced home for his tea. Dilly and the other trailers stay behind at the factory. Something needs to be done about that boy. Yes, it has. He told me Fred was dead. He told me I had a record deal with Simon Trowell. I got covered in salt, which turned out to be sugar. That's nothing. He hit my shell, left me naked. He woke me from my nap calling me a German chancellor. It's time to give him a taste of his own medicine. They all huddled together and hatched a scheming plan. They simply couldn't take any more of Graham's fooling around. It was time for Dillis to call in that favour from her old friend, James Thomas III. Unusually for Graham, the next morning he overslept and for the first time in his life he was actually late for work. He bolted out of the bed and raced to the factory at lightning speed. Graham burst through the main doors of the factory. Good morning, you eager beavers. You lot were up and about early this morning. To his horror, Graham realised that the trailers weren't at work. They were missing. He went on a mad dash around the factory. Merle? Dillis? Merle? Fred? Are you there? It felt strange to be alone in the factory without the normal noise of the machines and the general hustle and bustle. In fact, it was quite spooky and Graham started to tremble with fear and a lone tear ran down his face. Kenneth? Avril? Sylvia? Bonjour, mon ami, shrieked the familiar French tone of the woodlands which is resident. Billionaire business bumblebee James Thomas III had been spying on Graham from the moment he had entered the factory and decided to leap out on him to give him a ride. Whoa, JT3, you scared the life out of me. Where is everyone? Now that, my dear boy, is the $64,000 question. Just where is everyone? Things have changed round here, Graham, and I don't think you're going to like it. What do you mean? Where are my family? Where's Dillis? Will you tell me what's going on, JT? I'm going to read you the note they have left, and I want you to listen to every word carefully. Can you do that? Yes, I can. Dearest Graham, we have some really sad news to tell you. By the time you read this letter, we'll be long gone. We have decided to leave the Woodles Woodland to set up a new home far, far away. We just can't take your practical jokes any longer. We are so unhappy and hurt by you joking around. But we have made this painful decision to leave you behind. If only things could have changed, been different, we we will all miss you, but not for not your pranks. Take care of yourself. Much love, the trails. 
With an enormous grin on his face, JT3 proclaimed, So they've gone and left you. Forget them. Don't worry, dear boy. You work for me now. I bought the cotton mill yesterday and I'm pleased to say that you are my new manager. Trouble is, you'll have to work six times as hard as you did before because you are going to be my only employee. Oh, and by the way, your new daily start time will be at 5 a.m. And did I mention that I am going to reduce your wages to save cost? JT3 gave the sly wink and started to fly off towards his new office. Come on, chop, chop. No, no, I don't believe it. My family won't just leave me like that. Read the notes, Sonny. They've all signed it. Well, I quit. Without my family, I am nothing. They mean the world to me. If it takes me the rest of my life, I will never stop looking for them, sniffed Graham as he bolted out of the factory for good. All the distress had made Graham light-headed, and he figured the best thing to do was to go back to his bedroom and lay on his bed for a while to gather his thoughts. The old log house seemed so cold and empty without the other trailers around. He climbed into bed and pulled the sheets over his head and began to uncontrollably sob his heart out. Oh, why did I have to be such a joker? Why didn't I realise the pain I was causing my family? If only I could turn the clock back. Graham suddenly stopped crying and lay perfectly still. He was certain he just heard a noise in his room. He snatched back the sheets and bolted upright. Hello? Is there anybody? Fred? Kenneth? Is it you, Myrtle? Oh, who am I kidding? Surprise! All the trailers, as they sprung out of their hiding places in Graham's bedroom, the joke's on you, Graham Trailer. We got you good style. Whoa, 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 I don't believe it. You mean this has all been one big joke? Yes, it has. And we haven't sold the mill to Street 3 either. He was in on the gag. All to teach you a lesson, Graham. You might not mean to cause harm and upset. But you have to remember that when it comes to joking around, there is a very definite time and place. Oh, don't you worry. I know that now. I will never pull another prank in my life. I thought I'd never see you guys ever again. Oh, I'm so happy. Graham was bouncing around the room, hugging and kissing the other trailers. He rounded everyone up for a group hug. Life in the old log house soon returned to normal. James Thomas III returned to his honey yacht for the summer months, and under the strong leadership of Dillis Crane, the cotton mill began to make record profits for the trailers. Everyone was happy, even Graham. The shock of being on the receiving end of a dramatic practical joke had taught him a lifelong lesson. And whilst he didn't give up practical jokes for good, he did learn and understand the very important rule that jokes and pranks have a time and place. He was now mature enough to realise that he had to control his behaviour and save his pranks for downtime with the family when everyone was playing and having fun. Friends may come and go, but family is forever. And that made Graham the happiest trailer of all.